morning everybody. This is Andrea Williams. I'm the director of plant science at the California Native Plant Society and I'm out today leading a hike for you um, in my local regional park obeying all posted signs but I wanted to show you this first because I am first and foremost a giant grass nerd and so this is Stipa lepida. This is foothill needlegrass and it's pretty closely related to Stipa pulchra um, purple needlegrass, which is our state grass, but um, the two of them grow together here. And one of the things that I want to focus on today is actually the signs that plants leave us to tell us a little bit about what this place used to be like or what it can be like in different times of the year. So this is one of our lovely coast live oak trees. And a lot of our oaks look kind of the same to a lot of people. But this one is fairly common on the coast, as one might expect. But it usually has cup-shaped leaves. And a lot of times in some of the drier spots, you won't get those cupped leaves. So another way that you can tell is when you flip over the leaf. See if I can get a good shot of this here. You should be able to see little hairs, hairy armpits, as we call them hairs in the leaf axles, and that's another telltale sign. It's flowering right now. These are little catkins releasing pollen that's making me sneezy. Um, but we won't get acorns until later in the season. Something else that I'm seeing here in the understory, this is thick stem sanicle, Sanicula crassicollis. It's one of the more common sanicles, particularly in this sort of wooded situation but it's one of the less showy ones, and so people tend to overlook it quite a bit. This over here with the white flowers is Rubus ursinus, California blackberry, Pacific dewberry. It has a lot of common names. You can tell it from the non-native blackberry. It's got three leaves and this stem, which is rounded. It's usually kind of glaucous, which means it's got a whitish covering that you can wipe away, but in this case I can't wipe it away because the stem is covered in these little prickles. One of the things that blackberries can get sometimes is this rust, and so you'll see that fungus on these leaves here causing a little bit of damage to the plant. And then the speckling in the background here, which is probably another kind of infestation, maybe a virus. This over here is a rush. This is Juncus patens, which is spreading rush. It's a little bluish green on the stem. It's one of two of our most common rushes. Um, one is Juncus patens, which is the one here. Another one is uh, Juncus pacificus, which is greener and a little more burly. Um, you'll see these not in the wettest of situations, but um, still tells you that it's a little moister than usual. We're just getting the first leaves of yarrow here. This will be the first time that I'll mention that I wish we had smell of vision because it's got a lovely scent to it and a lot of medicinal uses, but it's not actually approved for use by the FDA because if you use it too much, it can actually cause vampirism. Well, not really. I mean, it just uh, makes you photosensitive, but it's more fun to say the other one. This is another one of our really common plants. This is Baccarus pilularis, coyote brush. Um, you can see a little bit of rust here as well as some galls. Coyote brush um, is really known for the number of different insects that live on it, and a lot of times these insects will cause galls on the plant, and so you'll see deformations of the leaf tip and little buds, bud looking things and dots on the leaves. Another plant that hopefully you know, right next to it, this is poison oak, Pacific poison oak, Toxicodendron diversilobus, diversilobum. Not so great with my endings when they keep changing things on me. You know, the leaves of three, let it be, if it's shiny, watch your hiney. Something else that I'm seeing here that tells me a little bit that this area might have used to have been more open. 
This is a monkey flower. This is shrubby monkey flower, or some people call it sticky monkey flower. Used to be Mimulus orantiacus, and now it's Diplocus orantiacus. So it's still kind of growing here, starting to get shaded out, overtopped by some of the other shrubs and trees. Some really pretty blooms on this poison oak. Also attracts a lot of insect visitors, and there's a little, looks like a yellow-headed bumblebee back there in the brush. Morning. Poison oak, definitely one of those plants that I appreciate from afar. Makes me super itchy. see some more monkey flower here definitely some gall formation some sort of insect activity on this poison oak here or poison oak coyote bush Baccarus pilularis there are actually two subspecies of the Baccarus there's Baccarus pilularis consanguinea which is this one chaparral coyote bush the one that we normally think of as coyote bush and then there's a coastal form which has fairly small leaves and grows flat along the ground. And that is Baccarus pilularis pilularis. Another nice coast live oak here. seeing a little bit of Scrofularia californica here. This is California figwort or California bee plant. I think we'll see some blooming up the trail a little bit. This one is just in bud. Oh, here we go. Here's a flower. So pretty small, but super cute. Let's see if I can get that in focus for you. The bees do like it. It tends to bloom a little more profusely out in the open where it gets a little more sun. So that plant is also telling me that this used to be slightly more open. Here's another nice shrub, actually a pair of them. So this is Frangula californica used to be Ramnus californica, this is coffee berry. Not seeing any berries on it, just starting to get the first flower buds there. There are several subspecies of this plant. This is Frangula californica californica. Inland areas you get the ones with uh, fuzzier leaves and that's Frangula californica tomentella. Tomentella, tomentum is just one of the many words that botanists have for hair. And this is hairy honeysuckle, or pink flowered honeysuckle. Only blooms pink for about a month out of the year, and so I tend to call it hairy honeysuckle because it's always hairy. This is Lonicera hispidula, and hispid is another word for hairy. But they're all different kinds of hairy. You can see here the poison oak leaves looking a little more lobed. Up here a little less lobed. I've always thought that they tend to look like what they're growing near just to fool me into touching them. But of course that's not true. Oh, I almost walked past a lovely soap plant. We're all thinking about soap this time of year. So this is Chlorogalum pomeridianum, probably variety pomeridianum. And lots of stuff to say about this. So there is a bulb underneath the ground, which is where bulbs are. And it's covered in this sort of horsehair looking covering. And the bulb itself has a lot of saponins in it. So you can use it for soap. Sorry, I got distracted by English ivy. Hold that thought. So this is English ivy, heterohelix 
growing kind of as an understory and growing up this tree a little bit. And English ivy is unlike all of the other native lianas, which is a name for a woody vine, um, in that it's evergreen. And so a lot of the other, um, you can also see some poison oak up in the canopy there. They'll all lose their leaves in the winter, but the English ivy stays evergreen, adds a little extra weight to the trees in winter, and that may or may not contribute to their failing. So this is a nice little starting to bloom walnut. There are a few trees that look like walnut, primarily um, Tree of Heaven, Ailanthus altissima. And I know this is California walnut, Juglans californica, um, partially because of the flowers, but also because of the leaves. The Ailanthus will have a little pit gland, and when you smell it, you rub the leaf a little bit, and smell it, the tree of heaven will smell like rancid peanut butter. And the walnut smells like walnut. So back to the soap plant, the chlorogalum, or chlorogalum, if that's how you want to pronounce it. Um, so it's got some saponins in it, and it can be used as a soap. If you want to pound it up, if you want to put it in a pool, it'll stun fish. If you want to roast it, you can roast it and eat it. If you want to strip the hairy covering of the bulb off, you can use it as kind of a brush, more like a paintbrush. So a lot of uses for that plant. Here's another plant with several uses. This is California bay laurel, Umbellularia californica. Up in Oregon, they call it Oregon myrtle. And in Northern California, on the border, they call it pepperwood. So, lots of different names for this tree. Another great one for smell-o-vision. Smells like bay. You can use it as a substitute for the bay leaves that you buy in the store, Loris nobilis. But this one is much, much stronger, so just be careful if you do use it. I've actually had a friend who had an allergic reaction to it, so as always, when you're using wild plants, just be careful. So I'm actually looking for a leaf that has some of the telltale spotting of sudden oak death. So these leaves have some spots on them, but they don't look like sudden oak death spotting. And sudden oak death spotting generally looks like a rain splash. Let me see if I can find one here. Not seeing it. Well, if I find one later, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Kind of like that. No, not like that. Little black spot, little yellow halo, little brown halo around that. Generally at the tips of leaves or where the rainwater collects on them. Here's another plant that has a use that we don't use. This is poison hemlock. It's a non-native kind of weedy plant. It tends to like sort of wetter areas. You can tell by the purplish spotting on the stems. I'm not going to touch it. Conium maculatum is the name for that. And there's another carrot family relative next to it. This is probably shepherd's needle or burr chervil, or hedge parsley. Let's take a look, because they all kind of have fluffy leaves, and whitish flowers, but you really want to look at those fruits. So these fruits are pretty even. They're not fairly elongated. So this is probably burr chervil, but I'm not super up on my parsley family weeds right now. So maybe I'll look it up later, but that won't really help you. Some of the other weeds that I'm seeing out here, I've got a little 
Italian thistle. This is Carduus pycnocephalus. And then here's a little bit of south thistle. This is Sonchus oleraceus. It's one of those dandelion family weeds with the milky sap in it. And then there's this little geranium, probably a dove's foot geranium, geranium uh, dissectum. Maybe geranium mall. They're practically the same as far as weediness goes, so I don't tend to make, take the time to make the distinction. So dismissive of me. There's a coast live oak with a lot of graffiti and a lot of wounding. You can see the bleeding cankers here. Where somebody's cut the tree, sometimes that's a sign of sudden oak death when they bleed like that. But these are all just from people cutting into the bark of a tree. I'll talk a little bit about Toyon, which is this bad boy right here. This is Heteromeles arbutifolia. And so the name of that means, hetero means different, meles means apple, arbutifolia means it's got leaves like an arbutus. So if you think of strawberry trees that are sometimes planted as ornamentals, that's an arbutus. And they are similar, but not the same. Toyon also called Christmas berry or Hollywood or California holly. Got those bright red berries in the fall and winter. Here is a patch that tells me that this area is probably fairly wet at some times of the year. This is teasel. And the reason I know that, this bright white midrib, and if you look on the underside, there are these interesting little prickles. Not any other plants I know that look like that on the underside of their leaves. Here's another little weedy plant. This is summer mustard or short pod mustard, Hirschfeldia and canna. Like a lot of the weedy mustards, the flowers tend to be a little smaller morning, and a little bit more yellow than some of the other mustards. Here's a lovely example in a sunnier spot of the bee plant or California figwort, Scrofularia californica. I really do enjoy the way those flowers look, particularly when they're in focus. Over here, I promise this is not all weeds, but it's another weedy little plant. This is fennel, Funiculum vulgare, with a morning dove in the background for ambiance. Oh, Sorry, I must be maybe near somebody's nest, so I'm going to move along. But I do want to stop and show you all the things that are going on at a very small scale here. If, again, I can get things in focus. So we've got this, which is a little native called Trifisaria pusilla. I can't see any flowering. I wish I could. The flowers on it are quite lovely. 
We've got this little weedy guy. This is a fillery, which is related to the geraniums. It's an erodium. And then these little guys, which are called woolly marbles. They're actually in the Asteraceae, in the sunflower family. And I'm blanking on the scientific name. There's some more little... It might be... That looks like a really small Saliva sessilis, which is a South American cabbage rose looking thing. And then we've got, you know, just your standard Plantago lanceolata. Well, it's not standard, it's miniature. They might show it in the toy group, but I don't think they have plant shows like that. This is the standard Plantago subnuda. Ooh, a little cloud of pollen there. There's some geranium here, some erodium here, and then some wild oats. So these are not the normal wild oats that you usually see, the wild oats that you usually see are Avena barbata, or slender wild oat. These are a little fatter. They're Avena fatua. They're also a little more blue. And the other way that you can tell is when you sort of peel apart the glooms, which are the outer bracts, from the seeds. You can see at the base of this on here, Right there. No, right there. There's little teeth. And they're really short. And on Barbada they'd be a couple more millimeters long. Which I'm sure many of you are saying, ha! Huh, good luck with that. Some other weedy grasses here. This is Lolium, now called Festuca multiflorum, or Perenne. They lumped them all together, and it makes me unhappy. Another weedy grass here. This is Bromus diandris. This is Ripgut brome, and you'll see this quite a bit in yards and around wild spaces. But I'm going to get back on the path now. Some more teasel rosettes there. There's another toy on here. Got some leftover berries that aren't looking quite so red anymore. They're more dried up and blackish, but quite a profusion of berries in the late fall and winter. Really great for birds. Some older Italian thistle. Sometimes they'll show that white marbling along the leaves, but they're fuzzy, unlike milk thistle, which has the white marbling but is smooth. And here, another weedy plant. This is probably Vichia velosa. There are a few vetches like this. There's Vichia velosa, Vichia bengalensis, Vichia craca. The inflorescence is kind of one-sided. You can count the number of flowers on those. And you can also compare the length of the inflorescence to the length of the leaf. And on this one, the inflorescence is longer than the leaf subtending it, which means something. But I don't remember which one that makes it. But you can look it up in the Vichia key. Here's some teasels showing those characteristic tops. I don't know if you were a child of the 70s as I was, but 
there was a lot of teasel and pampas grass as dried flower arrangements when I was growing up. Here's another little weed. It has a very pleasant scent to it. This is pineapple weed. It smells like it smells like pineapple, oddly enough. So that one has a lot of scientific names. They've moved it around throughout the years. Matracaria, Matracarioides, uh, Chamomila, I think Suaviolans. But I always just call it pineapple weed. Yeah, that's still just Italian thistle. Big enough to be a milk thistle, but it's fuzzy, not smooth. There's another weedy grass. This is what people call, well, actually people call all grasses foxtails, but this is officially a foxtail. This is Hordium murinum. Those long awns, it's a barley. That really, I don't want to say rigid in fluorescence, because it's not, but it's a spike, so you don't see any branching in that. And really long awns, which are these bristles here. And there's another weedy vetch right here. This is Vicia sativa. There's two subspecies of it. One has bigger flowers, tends to be this more purplish color. Comes out in the winter, call it winter vetch. And then there's one that usually comes out in the summer. Um, and it's pinkish, and I threw that away a little too soon because I wanted to show you that it's just got these two little flowers that come right out of this axle, this joint of the stem and the flower. Well, here's some native grass. So this is Bromus carinatus, lovely maroon color. Um, this is related to the ripgut brome, but you can tell the awns are much, much shorter. Short-lived perennial grass um, does really well in plantings. Just wanted to show you real quick this coastal sage. This is Artemisia californica. There's Mount Tam. There's a truck backing up. So Artemisia californica, good landscaping plant, likes a fairly sandy soil, but you can find it from the coast almost to the desert. Got a really broad environmental tolerance. All yellow in here. Oh, it's a mustard. This little yellow right here. This is a metacago. It's one of those burr clovers you see. This is probably mm, hard to tell the metacagos without fruit. This one, most of them are polymorpha. I don't know if you can see the fruit on that. It's a little bit coiled into a spiral and a little bit hooked bird. So some people say that's the Inspiration for Velcro. They call it the Velcro plant. There's another native grass there at the top of the ridge. This is, used to be Lamus triticoides, now it's Elemus triticoides. Creeping wild rye. So really rhizomatous grass grows in these Kind of dense clumps here. You can see last year's flower stalks. Another spike-like inflorescence. No awns on this one though. What a lovely weed. This is Cynara cardunculus, cardoon or artichoke thistle. 
it is related to the, the uh, artichoke pretty closely, and you can actually eat them. Let's see if we can get in. Little tiny artichoke in the center of the stem there. That's actually the bracts around the flowers. But it's a fairly nasty weed here, particularly in the East Bay and a little bit around the peninsula and some areas in Southern California. There's another artichoke thistle. And then we've got this rhizomatous plant here. It's definitely in the aster family. See right there, and then the leaves right here. So this is Aster chilensis. They changed the name to Symphiotrichum chilens, I believe, which is as hard to say as it is to spell. So Chilean Aster, or Pacific Aster, are a couple of the common names for this. This is another one that's actually pretty good in landscaping. Um, great late summer plant, and this tells me that this area is fairly moist, particularly um, through to the late summer. So that's an interesting thing to note about this spot. It could be just the way that the water is coming off the trail, but it could also be that there's a spring here. There's a little more fennel, some mustard. So even if I didn't have these yellow blooms here in the foreground, you can tell from these dried dead stems that there's an infestation of mustard here of some sort. Hard to tell just from those stems if it's Brassica nigra, which is black mustard, or if it's Hirschfeldia ancana, as it is here. I'll walk you over to this guy here. So earlier we saw Sonchus oleraceus. This is Sonchus or Sonchus asper. And the difference is in these leaf bases. So this one is coiled like a snake, like an asp. And that's how I tell the two of those apart. of poison oak here and some poison hemlock for good measure so just in case you want to be super itchy and then dead you can roll around in one and eat the other let's go up this hillock here see what we see off the day with Stipa lepida, and I'm going to stop here with Stipa pulchra. Thanks, everybody.